real believer that I have to be haunted or the want has to be fairly deep in order for me to follow through with the making of a piece, especially with the larger works. There's a huge amount of investment in that, of time and of labor, and I have to really want it. I often have an image in my mind that I start with because you have to have somewhere to start. If it's a bowl shape, I draw what I think the size of the bottom of the bowl might be. I start there by putting a four by four first where that circle is and cutting out one piece that might fit into it. Once I have one piece, I'll add another one that reacts to that piece and then I'll go to the other side and so on. So there are many, many opportunities that I have to make decisions in terms of what happens to the look of that piece. I rarely, rarely make models and never make drawings. And I never analyze it like with so many words and because those things are so punitive for me to just kind of punish myself with, with concepts that are, you know, more than I need. So it's all very pruned, you know, it's all very, uh, kind of very directly affects what I'm doing at the time. The title of the piece is Odydychanka. I think it's Polish. I mean, it is Polish, but there is no such word in the Polish language. But there's a word that is Odydychach, means to breathe. And I just added Odydychanka to make it a female breathing. I don't want to make any kind of a literal connection to the title. I would like the title to have something to do with the piece, but it's only a something that's somewhere in my mind that cannot be explained so easily. And that connection is <coughs> often obtuse to the world at large, which for me gives that piece many more chances to make metaphorical links to a greater part of the world. I almost thought of it as a kind of collar. There is a way in which it sort of has a possibility of spreading around the chest. And I thought then of adding, inserting, this little part that flipped out, something that was going to misbehave in connection with the kind of order, orderly waves, you know, that the rest of the piece had. It's a relatively small piece as my pieces go but I think it's one of my favorite small pieces. It's got some graphite on it, and the graphite is put on more gently than I ordinarily put the graphite on my work. And that these, this wayward, this irregular part that I inserted at the end feels almost like some kind of a scarf that you would throw over yourself that really isn't, doesn't follow the molds of your body, that it's kind of more free to do as it needs to do. I get the cedar from British Columbia, from Vancouver, and I have it milled in very particular measures. But the cedar itself somehow seems to be the material in which for now, but I should say that that for now is the past 35 years, has been the material that I seem to be able to speak through in a way that seems most potent. That's not to say that I'm not looking for another material all the time. That's not to say that I don't want another material all the time. And it's not as though I'm waiting for the cedar to fail on me. It's not like that, but it might in fact. So I'm not in love with wood. I actually really dislike the grain. The grain feels drooly and it feels, you know, like psychedelic crud, you know, those kinds of repetitive lines. But cedar has, doesn't have much of a grain. And cedar is not, you can't really shine, you can't really make cedar shine. And I hate anything that's glossy or that, you know, that has a, a sharp reflection. So it just happens to be the material that works in terms of saying what I need to say through that. One of the important qualities of cedar is its softness. 
and with each curve that one makes with a straight blade, you have to make many, many straight cuts so that you nibble away maybe 30 or 40 nibbles, straight nibbles, in order to make that curve. And of course, my whole trip has to do much, much more with the, uh, the curves and the sensuality than they do with the hard edges.